says that he really needs to minimize the impact this is going to have on his wife because he knows exactly what's at his house and what they're going to find. So then he says, go get a map. I'll show you where Jessica Lloyd's body is. Well, Rach screwed me. I didn't mean to. Y'all. <laughs> she, I had drafted this story. I have three pages down, drafted. And here Rach is being like, all right, let's record. I'm going to do And I'm like, you know I've done him. Nope. Uh-uh. We're not saying the name. It's the Tweed Creeper. Oh, I'm sorry. Beep it out, please. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't mean to. I asked her if she had heard of it weeks ago, and she was like, yeah. And I was like, great. That's I, all. You didn't say, I, I like, I started that. it. Uh, and I was like, great. I, I hate that you've heard of it, but whatever. I'm doing it. Um, nope. No idea. So, because we were talking to someone from Canada and it started, this whole conversation started and I said, wait, don't say another word because I've already drafted three pages. You didn't get it from that? that I no, from? I didn't. I forgot about that. Okay. So actually on that note, um, we are going north of the border for this one. And I know it's this, not Ken and Barbie. It's not Ken and Barbie. I know that this is a big one for you Canadian listeners, but I hadn't heard of it until... We were talking to our friend Brenda, who hosts Horrifying History podcast, and she lives in the area that this took place and actually knew the person mm -hmm. who, whose name whose name we are not saying. Speaking of Horrifying History, hold on one second. I just listened to the Laura Lee Michael episode, which mm -hmm. here's what I like about Well, it's a, about a child star who um, I think she actually ends up going missing. I haven't finished the episode. But she, there's child abuse and stuff in this episode, but, but uh, they're not all like that. But what I like about it is, so she's a child star. So Brenda gives like a history lesson on that industry altogether. Like there is like this. Um, oh, that's nice. Like how studio, movie studios used to like control their actors. Like this woman, oh, yeah. Eleanor Powell was a dancer and she signed with like, I think MGM or something. Is that one? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, a big yeah. one, actually. A big one. Uh, but they didn't like, it was like in the 50s or something, but they didn't like her freckles. So they gave her like this treatment that like peeled off her skin, but she didn't have freckles anymore. So, you know, you Ugh. couldn't get married without your studio's permission. Like they, yeah. I did not know any of that shit. Even Hayden Pan Panettiere, according to Horrifying History, said when she was 13, she was given alcohol and what they used to call a happy pill to make her more talkative and alert in public. So she was like, I'm pretty sure it was Adderall. Yeah. They, Judy Garland, there's like a whole thing about that too. They were just pump her with speed when they, when she was feeling tired. <laughs> but that's crazy. so crazy. It just gave this like whole history lesson before getting into the, uh, Laura Lee Michael. That's good. Um, yeah. I like that. Very I interesting. That. I was like, damn, very interesting. So, yeah, we were talking to her and she mentioned this and I know it's a big deal and it's a big story. I had not heard of it. And I was like, what? But I do remember you saying, don't say any more. Whatever. Mm. I took it. It is what it is. And now it's episode 109 and you can sit there and take it. Okay. So can I ask one more thing and then oh, we'll okay. start our story? Sorry, everyone. Sorry. Not, well, not ask more of a request. Let me penny for your thoughts. So Rach ha actually brought up an idea about changing our cover photo. Our artwork. Our artwork. So right now, where, where'd you even get that? Those two girls holding hands. And where'd you get that? We bought it. Some stock. Okay. Uh -huh. It's just stock photo. And then we played with it. We bought it and then I played with the filters okay. in Photoshop. And then she thought of an idea of like, <laughs> I just having a little irony and having it like very pretty, like, uh, like Bubbly, flowery, happy artwork. <laughs> With people are the worst. That says people are the worst. Like and pinks and, and bright colors. And it's just like pretty. And then you read it and you're like, oh, uh-huh. Because, yeah. Because I was thinking about it and I'm like, oh, wait, that could be interesting. Because it'd be more, I feel like, approachable. Like, if I were a listener of and no one knew people are the worst... I would be wary to like wear merch with our current logo. Like it just seems so kind of dark and like, okay. Like, I remember yeah. first listening to my favorite murder and being, and they're like, we're selling shirts now. And I was like, I would never wear a shirt that says my favorite murder. It's so yeah, crass. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, if they were flowery and like, yeah, clearly, a, yeah, irony or clearly ironic, then it'd be, I don't know. 
So what do y'all think? Have you drawn? Yeah, what do y'all think? I also read somewhere that branding, like if our pictures are on it, or that somehow they know it's two girls talking, like they're two co-hosts, so it's not so serious. Like if you've seen um, Phoebe Judge's artwork podcast, The Criminal, you know, Um, like no jokes will be told. Oh, yeah. It's a white background with criminal on it Uh with Phoebe Judge. Oh, my gosh. Her voice is lovely, though. Oh, I know. It's soothing. Um, Yeah, that's true. Like, make it a little bit more fun. Like, okay, it's not like it's a little light. A a lighter take is what it is. On dark ass stories. The subject matter is not light and we know it is serious. But, you know, y'all know what we mean. Yeah. So what do y'all think about that? I said it like in passing and Rebecca has not stopped bringing it up. So I'm like, well, oh, I'm like, maybe okay, it is something that we would do. Be, yeah. Maybe it'd be more approachable. Maybe if you're scrolling through, you know, true crime top charts and you see that opposed to two girls in the woods or whatever. I don't mm-hmm. know. They'll, they'll know that it's like, okay, it's two girls kind of riffing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So yeah. what do y'all think? Anyone in branding out there? We need a chief branding officer of some company that's wildly successful. Who is dying to work for free? <laughs> Please. I was going to go to Upwork and submit, you know, whatever a job there. And I was like, let's just put it out to our listeners. They know us best because the Upwork would be like, will you listen to like five episodes so you really get us? Yeah. You know? You know. Um, so let us know what you think. And here is the ironic part. We hate like bright color floral. Lily Pulitzer is not our style. Right. So... It's a there, challenge. There's the irony for you. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So I'm telling y'all about the Tweed Creeper, as I mentioned. Sources, a case study from the book, Explorations in Forensic Psychology, Cases in Criminal and Abnormal Behavior by Margot C. Watt, PhD. Ooh, I like that. I know. I got a ton of articles from cbc.ca, and they, I guess they have a show called The Fifth Estate. It seems you know, Dateline-ish, theglobeandmail.com, and the Toronto Star. In 2007 and 2008, there were a string of break-ins around Ottawa, as well as the town of Tweed, which is a small lake town about two-ish hours away. In 2016, the population of Tweed was like 1,700 people. So it's just a small, you know, Mm. lake town. If having your home broken into wasn't creepy enough, the items that were missing made it much more creepy. Mm Mm-hmm. It wasn't typical jewelry, money, TVs, et cetera. It was personal items like family pictures, bathing suits, most of all, women's underwear. Ew. Sometimes even young girls' underwear would also be missing as young as nine years old. It's disgusting. One of the victims to these break-ins included a 12-year-old girl whose underwear was missing, and on her computer, there was an open Word document where the intruder wrote, Merci, which is- Oh, I don't remember that part. Ugh. Which is French for thank you, mm, if thank you needed you. to know. Merci for explaining that. You're welcome. French wasn't my thing. In two years, there were 61 break-ins, and most of them were unreported because victims didn't even realize their homes had been broken into. But we have a confession and disgusting receipts, and we'll get to that later. So that's how we know how many there actually were. The ones that were reported were when things like semen was left behind in their room. Like one person found semen on the, on top of the dresser in her room, I guess. Eventually, they were referred to as fetish break-ins, but then it escalates. On September 17th, 2009, a woman in Tweed, whose name has never been made public, was asleep at home with her infant daughter when a man broke in and stripped her naked. He then bound her and blindfolded her, fondled her, and took pictures of her while she was naked and bound. He did this for two hours, all while promising not to harm her or her baby, and he didn't. He just left. Yeah. That was it. So she got she got free and called the police. Unharmed. Sir, you've done plenty of harm. Right. Right. Two weeks later, on September 30th, 2009, almost the exact same thing happened to a woman named Lori Massacott. She actually applied to have the publication ban on her identity lifted so she could speak out as a part of her personal healing process, which is awesome. It's awesome either way. I totally understand wanting to keep totally. her name sealed. I just wanted to point that out so people didn't think I, like, sneakily found it and said it. Sure. So she wanted her name revealed. Yeah. She was at home alone in Tweed when she woke up to someone smothering her with a blanket and punching her in the side of the head. She said she was so disoriented and short of breath that she thought the house was on fire and her lungs were filling with smoke. Oh, my God. He stripped her naked, bound and blindfolded her. 
and forced her to pose in explicit ways while he took pictures. Unbeknownst to her, this intruder had already been in her home several times before stealing her lingerie and underwear. Oh, see, I don't, clearly I wasn't done with my draft, but I don't remember that particular one. Jesus. Yeah. This went on for three and a half hours before he apologized for punching her in the head, gave her some aspirin, and left. Ew. She was in complete shock that she was even alive, that she didn't, she couldn't call the police for an hour and a half. She just, like, could not believe what just happened. Right. She told the cops that- And he's, like, guilt-free. He's like, I gave her aspirin and said sorry. Guilt-free. Yeah. He's, yeah. His conscience is wiped. Oh, totally. So annoying. She told cops that she had a blindfold on, so she couldn't see who it was, but his voice did sound familiar. She later said there was a chance it could be her neighbor named Larry Jones. Mm -hmm. Cops swarm Larry's house. He comes home, and they're in his house, seizing a bunch of shit, cops everywhere. It's three doors down from Larry's house. Ultimately, nothing comes from this. He eventually actually sued them for damages because... Word got out that they suspected him. It ruined his reputation. He also accused his former in-law, Jonas Kelly, of feeding Lori his name to accuse him, to go to the cops and accuse oh, him. Oh, wow. Jonas, and he's like a, he was on that Dateline episode and he was like, he's like a long time resident of Tweed. I think his parents grew up there. He was like, I've been a member of this community. And just like that, my name is Soiled. Yeah. Yeah. They all knew each other. So Jonas Kelly, the guy he accused of telling Lori to go to the cops with his name, Jonas Kelly's daughter and Larry Jones' son were married, but had recently gone through a messy separation, about to uh, get divorced. Uh -huh. So he thought his former in-law was just out to get him. So he was also included in the lawsuit. And I don't ever, I don't know what ever came of this lawsuit, but he's cleared. If that's true, that is a low blow in law. My God. Well, he he did say his name. He uh, the Jonas Kelly guy did. In an article he was interviewed, admit it. But he was like, I didn't say he definitely did it. I just said he could have done it. I'm like, well, that's, mm. uh, well, okay, sure. There's a man that did A man lives in Tweed. I know a man in Tweed. Could have yeah. been. Yeah. So, I don't know. Um, I don't know what came of that lawsuit, but Larry Jones is eventually cleared. On November 17th, 2009, a woman named Ann Cook came home from work to get ready really quick for a birthday party that her good friend and neighbor, Howard, was hosting. When she got to her bedroom, she noticed that her bedside table drawers were open and rifled through. But the only things missing were, sex. it kept saying sex toys, I'm guessing vibrators. She thought someone was playing a joke on her, so she called Howard to come over. He lives, like, down the street. Mm-hmm. And he tells her he didn't do it and he's not playing any pranks. So they start debating if she should call the cops or if she was too embarrassed. Ultimately, she decided that she was too embarrassed, but she was scared. So she packed an overnight bag so she could stay the night at Howard's after the party. The next morning, she came home to get ready for work. And on her computer, someone had written, go ahead and call the police. I want to show the judge your really big dildos. She oh, said she so screamed out loud. Because he was obviously hiding in her house when she had that conversation with ha Howard. Mm -hmm. And based on a linen closet that was destroyed when she came home to get ready for work, she's guessing that's where he was hiding. Right. Ugh. And her house is a big, beautiful, creaky floor type of oh. old house. It is badass. But I imagine living there alone, even the wind would make it creak and it'd be a little spooky. Ooh. Oh, seeing her, the actual room again on that dateline oh. of where that computer was and what I'm like, oh God, you're like upstairs alone in this, oh God, I don't know. Gosh. That was just in your closet. That was creepy as shit. That is really scary. It was actually that moment on dateline. I was like, oh, I'm going to have to do this. <gasps> I just, oh, the, maybe the, I should have watched it. I'll watch it <laughs> after this. <laughs> yeah. Everyone should. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. So as word gets out about the assaults on Jane Doe and Lori, the media starts referring to him as the Tweed Creeper, and the escalation keeps going. On November 25th, 2009, Corporal Marie France Como, who was a 37-year-old military flight attendant based at the Canadian Forces Base Trenton, which is the biggest and busiest Air Force base in Canada, had just come home from a trip, and even though it was late at night, she didn't go right to bed. She went downstairs to the basement to look for her cats. And when she got down there, she found a man in a ski mask hiding behind her furnace. Oh, I the, don't remember that. She went to get the cat because the cat was by the furnace looking at something. 
Oh, God. And it was a man in a ski mask. Oh, my God. Isn't that creepy? She screamed, and the intruder hit her in the head with a flashlight. They struggled, but the intruder overpowered her and tied her to a pole. Then he covered her mouth with duct tape and took pictures of her. Then he took her upstairs and raped her for two hours, all the while videotaping his this torture. And the the other two, the Jane Doe and Lori, he never raped. I mean, he certainly sexual assault, but like yeah. never full on rape. Now he's raping. Escalating. She's begging him to stop and not to kill her. And when he's done, he adds duct tape to her nose and takes more pictures. And she essentially suffocates. Horrifying. Then he cleans up the scene with bleach, takes some lingerie and leaves. Her boyfriend found her body the next day. And we later learned that the tweed creeper had been in her house a few days before while she was away to confirm that she lived alone. Mm. So now this has escalated into murder and it shook the community. Marie France's family was devastated, saying she had found her calling when she joined the army, following in her dad's fo- footsteps. Her last assignment was accompanying Prime Minister Stephen Harper to India, and when she got back, she was in very high spirits. Mm. The Canadian Forces Base, or CFB Trenton, the base commander, Russell Williams, sent the letter of family of condolences saying that Marie France was a professional, caring, and compassionate woman. She was buried at the National Military C- Cemetery in Ottawa. Is that like Arlington Cemetery here? Yeah, I think it's, it's a big deal. Yeah. On January 29, 2010, a 27-year-old named Jessica Lloyd didn't show up for work, so her coworkers called her family, and at 9.30 a.m., her brother goes over to her house and finds that it's empty, even though her purse, her Blackberry, everything she would have taken with her are there. So he calls the police immediately and files a missing persons report. Police get to her house and there's snow on the ground, so they notice distinct tire tracks and boot impressions that are left on her property. They take impressions and start a massive search for her. As news spreads about her disappearance, three different witnesses came forward saying that they were driving on the highway that ran right in front of Jessica's house the night of January 28th and early morning of January 29th and noticed an SUV parked in the field by her house. And they just happened to notice it because it wasn't in the driveway. So it was just like, this, it just stood out. Yeah. Those accounts range from 9.30 p.m. to 3.20 a.m. So now they have the distinct tire tracks and a general description of this mm-hmm. SUV. Yeah. On February 4th, a week after her disappearance, the Ontario Provincial Police, also called the OPP, set up a road yeah, you block. you know me. I knew you were I knew. I was waiting. They said... <laughs> They set up a roadblock on that highway in front of Jessica's house to see if they can match the tire tread to any of the motorists. One of the cars they stopped was a Pathfinder, and even though it was an exact match, they let them go so they could surveil them and continue gathering evidence so they could be damn sure before they made an arrest. Mm -hmm. The reason they wanted to be damn sure was because the driver of the Pathfinder was the commander of the CFB Trenton, Colonel Russell Williams, the same base commander who wrote Mar- Marie France's family a condolence letter. Mm-hmm. That was a bomb drop, my sound effect. He ran the most important, as they later say, the biggest, busiest, most important air base in Canada, oversaw all of it. He is one of the most powerful people. He has flown the queen. Well, I'm not there yet. I'll tell you about that. Oh. You pipe down. I'm not talking <laughs> to you at this point. I'm talking to them. <laughs> my, okay. By all means. So let me tell you more about Russell Williams, and I'll bring you up to date with these very shocking details of his crimes to come. Russell Williams was born in England in 1963. When he was three, his family moved to Canada after his dad took a job at a nu- nuclear power re- research facility. He graduated high school in 1982 and went on to the University of Toronto Scarborough, where he started taking flying lessons. And guess who he reportedly knew, sometimes partied with while at university? Ken. Ken of Ken and Barbie, Paul Bernardo. Paul Bernardo. I said Just, I wouldn't call them Ken and Barbie. That's right. Ew. Ew gross. No, Paul Bernardo. They went to the University of Toronto Scarborough at the same time. Ew. Majored in the same, I mean, had the same major and apparently partied together every once in a while. And were very disgusting and rapey. Awful. In 1987, after graduation, he joined the military. 
1991, he married his wife, Mary Elizabeth Harriman. They moved to the Orleans suburb of Ottawa in 1995, where she worked as an executive for the Heart and Stroke Foundation. Their friends and neighbors said they were a perfect power couple. They were into golf and boating and fitness, often seen walking around Ottawa holding hands, just nice, normal people. They never had kids, but they made really good friends with their neighbors who had a 12-year-old daughter, and they said Russell was great with her. The 12-year-old daughter even had a school report about someone she looked up to, and she (gasps) wrote about Russell. Oh. Like went and sat and interviewed him. Oh. In 1999, Russell was promoted to major. In 2004, he got his Master's of Defense Studies from the Royal Military College and was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. Around this time, he was piloting dignitaries like Prime Minister Stephen Harper, Queen Elizabeth Prince Philip, as Rebecca already mentioned. Mm -hmm. Just all the important people. So he rose the ranks fast and he was very decorated for for exemplary service. Mm. In 2004, Mary Elizabeth and Russell bought a, the little lakefront cottage on Cozy Cove Lane in Tweed, which is where he spent a lot of his time starting in 2009 when he was promoted to colonel and became the commanding officer at CFB Trenton. This because that base is close to is closer to Tweed than Ottawa was, so he stayed there during the week, and Mary Elizabeth would come oh, yeah. up on weekends. I remember, yeah, yeah. So that's why a lot of the crimes took place in that area because he was there by himself a lot. Gross. His military rank was so high that his security clearance rating was top secret, classified. I mean, how are you this big of a monster? You are so good at hiding it. So good at hiding it. Until those pictures come out. (laughs) They are. (laughs) We'll get there. We'll get there. So embarrassing. We'll get there. (laughs) In December 2009, he welcomes the Olympic torch when it stops in Trenton before the Winter Olympics started in Vancouver. Like, he is a very public figure. Yeah. Until he's a naughty little girl. I mean, oh, my God. (laughs) We'll get there. We will get there. So now we're really not trying to make light of it. His crimes are disgusting. But the pictures that he took of himself are, you can laugh at. Permission to laugh at. No, you will. We'll get there. Hold on. So now we're back to February 2010. His tire tracks match the ones found at Jessica's house. Hmm. So on February 7th, they bring him into the police station in Ottawa for questioning. The entire interrogation is online. You, you, I mean, you can watch it. He's very cooperative. Mm-hmm. He happens to be wearing boots. And so they ask him for the for said boots. And he is like, sure. Gives it to him so they can match impressions found at Jessica's house. He also gives fingerprints and DNA so they can test that against DNA found at the crime scenes, which there's plenty of. Mm-hmm. They ask if he had anything to do with the four cases they're investigating. Again, two sexual assaults of Jane Doe and Lori Mascott, as well as the murder of Marie France and the disappearance of Jessica Lloyd. And he says, no, of course not. They're talking for hours and the entire time Russell is cool, calm and collected. The investigators are pretty strategic with it, too. They notably do not call him Colonel or Sir. They want to mm-hmm. reinforce that he's on their turf and uh, he's yeah. he's not in charge here. They are. It's good. That Fifth Estate episode, that show, like really digs into stuff like that. It's good. Ooh, okay. After almost five hours of talking to the investigator, they tell him that his tires were a match, as were his boots. The DNA hasn't been tested yet, obviously, but as soon as it comes back with a positive match, it's all over. Right. And they tell him that they are getting a search warrant right now to go search his house. And this is when he gets kind of nervous. Cut. Dude, you're screwed. You're well, busted. He, he, he says that he really needs to minimize the impact this is going to have on his wife because he knows exactly what's at his house and what they're going to find. Mm-hmm. So then he says, go get a map. I'll show you where Jessica Lloyd's body is. Full disclosure, I drafted this probably a year ago. It was just like one of those, okay, let me just jot this down while I have it in my mind. And I got three pages done before I was, I guess mm-hmm. I found something else. I don't remember. So like, I don't, I, I thought it was just, okay. Anyway, sorry. I'll stop reminding you that I know it because I clearly don't. I don't remember Jessica. Really? Sad. No. Sad. He also tells them exactly where the evidence of his crimes are hidden in, hidden in his Ottawa home, which is in boxes in the attic and basement. And there they find a treasure trove of videotapes. There are almost 3,000 pictures and 1,400 pieces of underwear. 
bras, underwear, lingerie, camisoles. Mm -hmm. Ugh. Ew. So he's arrested and charged with two counts of first degree murder and two counts of sexual assault. He's there for another five hours, confessing to everything, going into graphic detail. And the next day he leads them to Jessica's body. And we'll get to those details in a second. They later tack on 82 counts of breaking and entering charges. 82. For the fetish break-ins. Ew. In April 2010, when he was in jail, he disabled the lock on his cell and attempted suicide by shoving a toilet paper roll down his throat. I think, hey. with, I think with toilet paper shoved in it. I guess to try to choke himself. He wrote a suicide note with mustard saying all of his affairs were in order and his feelings were just too much to bear, but it didn't work. So he's held in custody until his trial date, which happens in October, 2010. Even though he pleads guilty, I guess their prosecutors, which are called crown attorneys Mm -hmm. still have to present statements of facts. So they spend the, the next two days showing the court all the evidence against Russell before he's formally convicted. So this is when we learn how fucking sick he is. Mm-hmm. It started with just breaking in his neighbor's house while they weren't home and stealing underwear. But then he started putting on the underwear and lingerie and taking pictures of himself and weird <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Y'all. <laughs> it looks like an AI generated picture. They are all online. It is this big, burly colonel of the military <laughs> and staring at as if he's in uniform. He's just staring at the camera. Well, and some, he's are. In a, some give a little tush. Oh, I need to look again because I was like, these are. That's why I, I mean, don't remember some of the details of the stories because those images live rent free in my head. Oh, my God. He is stoic looking at the camera in a pink lace teddy. Like it is. <laughs> It looks AI generated. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Hold on, wait. I just want to make sure I'm telling the truth. Hold on. Maybe I just created it. You just want to see it again. Oh, yeah. He he gives a little too. (laughs) Well, he gives a back end. Yeah, he does. Well, but even that, he's he just turns around. He's so stoic. You you would think he was actually in his military uniform. It really is. Or a mugshot or something. He's so serious. But he's he's so in these these little little tiny undies it's very bizarre and they played it for all probably he want to take this to his grave but he left his face in he is of one of the highest ranks in the military in charge of thousands of people and i'm like you're earning respect in this oh my god yeah no for the the it's horrifying but just ridiculous at the same time just google them you'll you know you'll know oh my god it's so bad i don't know it's hard he says to... during the interrogation like right before he confesses like can i count on y'all's discretion and they're like sure sure no actually they're going to be on the internet forever but also on when you google it and you're scrolling through the pictures of him they also have the pictures of the amount of stuff they found at his house it is unreal how much underwear he stole and bras and it's disgusting and if i recall they're in very precise order like he is very military for sure oh he is like organized he is i'm like whoa it looks like a boutique yeah it looks like a yes they're they're walking into a lingerie store organized very bizarre properly placed oh but anyway that it gets so much worse It, it is funny to think of this you know high power and man. like so annoying that you, can i count on your discretion yeah we owe you you murdered and raped people but yes right. we will not let your fetish out yeah sure yeah. sure 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 you deserve that trust well he this was before he confessed so uh, it's not just the pictures it's just everything he's like once that rumor mill gets started you know it's hard to stop and the guy's like mm, that's why we're here on a sunday he just like threw something out there he's like that wasn't why we were there on a sunday we're there on a Sunday because that's just when it happened. Yeah. No one gives a shit about it Sunday. Whatever. And no one gives a shit about your rights when you ugh, don't commit yeah. the crimes. If you don't want them out there. Yes. Sorry. Um. So he takes pictures of himself. In one of the neighbor's house, he spent three hours in their 12-year-old daughter's room putting on her oh. underwear, masturbated on her bed, and ejaculated in her underwear, taking pictures of every step of this. This was the 12 year old daughter who wrote the report about someone oh. she admired. Oh, it his was? good friend's daughter who he spent a ton of time with. That is disgusting. 
Yep. I mean, it's all disgusting, but I didn't, oh God. There are a ton of pictures of him masturbating in various victims' rooms. What is that mindset? What is that fetish? That is so bizarre, but he never, he never abused anyone, um, child, right? It's Um, just an, or that we know of. That we know of, but we get to that, that it was 100% going to lead there. And I'm saying that as not a psychologist. Um, it was going to lead to that. There's no way it wasn't. And we'll get no, to why in a minute. Okay. Aside from the obvious, but that book that I sourced does have go really deep into obviously the psychology of it. I didn't have time to dig into that, to be honest. I just had time to dig into the crime. There, So yeah, there's picture after picture of him masturbating in just various people's rooms. Of course, the evidence of the Jane, Jane Doe and Lori mascot break-ins came to light. With Jane Doe, he returned to her house several times after the assault while she wasn't home, did his typical raid of more underwear. He also took videos of her driver's license and just other random personal items. He didn't know Lori Massacott, but she was his neighbor on Cozy Cove Lane in Tweed. So I think he just saw her around. During her assault, he kept assuring her that he wasn't going to hurt her and he was complimenting her appearance a lot. He also said that she was very nice and had a very nice house. And would ask her personal questions as he fondled her breast. No. I like, mean, it's just so no. bizarre. Within his keepsakes, they also found pictures of newspaper articles about the assaults, calling him the Tweed Creeper. And then pictures after that, the same articles burning in a fire. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, it's the picture. I'm, I'm just, is it himself? Because in every picture, his face is shown. So I'm like, is it you? You found yourself so attractive in women's underwear or but then he like he has no it's a lot of pictures of the victims and close-ups of privates is it the thrill of getting caught like it's just so bizarre what is this fetish i don't know it seems like the escalation there's something with the risk there because again it started when just no one was home and you're just stealing stuff yeah and then that was exciting so it yeah on to the next level and just became the worst yeah person then they present the pictures and videotapes of the murders, and they are horrible. I'll go into them, but more, some of it's graphic. Oh, he videotaped the actual murders? Yes. Oh, uh-uh. In the case of Marie France, obviously he was her commander, but he only had one interaction with her, which was when she was the flight attendant on one of his military flights. Given his position, though, he had access to her address, So when he found out she was out of town, he went over there, parked in the woods by her house, broke in through the basement, and spent over an hour there putting on her underwear and taking pictures of himself while playing with the sex toy. I don't know if it's the same sex toy that he stole previously. Who knows? Mm -hmm. While he was there, also figured out that she lived alone. So a few days later, when he knew she was coming back in town, he did it again, broke into her basement and hid while he was waiting for her to go to sleep. But when she didn't go to sleep and actually came downstairs, he was very caught off guard. And when she found him and started screaming, he just started hitting her with a flashlight. There weren't curtains on the windows, so he used kitchen knives to pin up bed sheets so the neighbors couldn't see in. Oh, God, that is creepy. Imagine walking in on that crime scene. I I know. Oh, God, curtains are hung with a knife. Yeah, and there's blood everywhere. There's pictures of that basement. No. Again, he tied her to the pole and then took her upstairs and assaulted her for hours. At one point, Russell leaves the room. I guess he thought he heard someone coming. So he gets up to go check and she runs to the bathroom. I'm assuming she was going to try to lock herself in, but he catches her before she gets there and hits her on the head again. Dude, you're in a ski mask. She wouldn't be able to identify you. Just leave her alone and run out. God, you are a monster. You're sick. The torture continues, and she's begging him not to kill her. This is all on videotape. <gasps> oh, even God. even saying, "quote Give me a chance. I'll be so good, please." And he promises that he's not going to kill her, and then puts the tape over her nose and starts taking pictures as she suffocates. <gasps> Two of the pictures of her were of her corpse. It is sick. He told oh, her he wasn't going to kill her, and then that was the only way she could breathe was on her nose because she already had duct tape yeah. on her mouth, and he put the tape right over her nose right after he said that it's bizarre after that he tucked her in bed with blankets and a comforter and then drove to ottawa for a meeting straight straight to ottawa shit 
Okay, so he's clearly a sadist. He likes to see pain. He likes to see them suffer. That's what the book that I sourced goes into. There's a whole... Ch- Ooh, the- him and Paul Bernardo were friends. Yeah, they... Oh, gross. Ew. Next, we get into the details of Jessica Lloyd. Russell admits that he didn't know Jessica at all, but in early January t- 2010, he was driving on the highway in front of her house, which he drove on a lot, and noticed her at her house running on the treadmill. He saw her through the window. So he, he decided to break in the next night while she wasn't home to, again, ensure she lived alone, which she did. So a few days later, on January 28th, Russell went to Jessica's house, parked in the field, and hid in her backyard waiting for her to get home. She got home at 10.30 p.m., and he waited a little while longer in her backyard for her to go to bed so he could break in and do the same thing. What's insane is an OPP officer was driving by Jessica's house that night before she got home, but while Russell was lurking in the backyard. Oh, my God. Saw his Pathfinder. She was one of the three who saw the Pathfinder part. She actually stopped at Jessica's house and knocked on the door because she thought it looked very suspicious. So she knocked on Jessica's door to see if she was okay, but no one answered, so the officer left. And that Wouldn't was that tell of- you that she wasn't okay? I know she wasn't home yet. But, like, that would be more suspicious to me and be like, oh, wait, now no one's answering. Let's go ahead and. I don't know. Russell watched this entire thing happen, but he later said he didn't realize that was a cop. He actually at first thought it was Jessica coming home. But when he realized it was someone knocking and then left, he was like, I had no idea who it was. But apparently now knowing what we know, that officer had a really hard time coping with not doing something more, which you can't you break in because you see a car parked in a weird spot. I think the main thing she wishes she got a license plate. She wishes mm-hmm. she searched the property, did something. She ended up taking some time off, even Aww. though her superiors were like, you did you did more than most people would have done. Most people I mean, would I was have about stopped. to say, I've, a lot of people would have probably just driven past. Yeah. Time. So they were like, you at least were able to give it a description. One of the people to give a description. So wow. but apparently she had a really hard time. Anyway, so, so Jessica is asleep, but wakes up just as Russell hits her in the head with a flashlight. He tied her hands with rope and put duct tape over her eyes before he cut her shirt off with a knife and took off her pants. He forces her to pose as he videos and photographs everything. He rapes her repeatedly and makes her model lingerie as, again, he takes pictures. After three hours of this, he forces Jessica into his car, all while promising to let her go as long as she cooperates, which she does. He drives her to the cottage in Tweed, which I think is like 30 minutes away from where she lived. When they get there, he emails work saying he's sick and he's not coming in. Then he tells her to get in the shower where he essentially bathes her. Oh, God. When, when, ugh, this gets hard. <sighs> when she gets out, she has a stressed, stress-induced seizure. And Aww. as she's convulsing, he's saying things like, hang in there, baby. Ew. Fuck you. After the seizure, he lets her sleep for a few hours, unbound but still blindfolded. And before I know people were like, how could you even fall asleep after that? Seizures knock you out. It would be impossible Uh not to. You are dead asleep after a seizure. So Mm -hmm. when she wakes up, she begs him to take her to the hospital. She's also begging him not to kill her and says, it's sad. It's in the video and it made me cry. I can tell. I was, I could tell like eight seconds ago, you were going to cry. I know. I don't (laughs) even know. I don't know this part. She says, if I die, we make sure my mom knows I love her. (gasps) And he continued to do it. When the court heard that part, several people audibly gasped, Jesus. People got up and left. And he was just fucking stoic, I'm sure. I don't think he cared. Clearly, he didn't care then. Holy shit. How old is she? I reread through this twice and I didn't cry. When I first read, I cried. And I can't say it. Saying it out loud was sad. I know. It always is. Poor. Jessica, how old is she? 27. Oh my God. And her mom was probably in the courtroom. Oh, oh 100%. To fucking strangle him. That is horrible. Isn't that so sad? Um, yeah. So if I die, we make sure my mom knows I'll love her. Then he, this is so bad. Oh God. Oh, sorry. We were this laughing last about some last sentence bag. of this. Okay. Last sentence of Jessica. It's gotten real dark. I, I know. It got yeah. real dark. He then gets her dressed and leaves the ties off of her hands, seemingly about to let her go, takes a few more pictures, I think gets her fruit. I don't fucking know. But one article said she was smiling while 
during this last picture because she was he was letting her go yeah i guess that was just one last way of to torture because then he strikes her on the head and then strangles her with the rope and takes more pictures of her dead body what the fuck all in all he had her captive for 19 hours holy shit oh god it is so scary to think she was doing absolutely nothing wrong he's running on a treadmill on a treadmill it's like my last story ginger has walked into a bookstore that's it it. insane just like not safe anymore. one little tiny change of a routine would have completely oh Oh. my god you did nothing and was he in a mask was she was blindfolded the entire time or like I'm like, oh, you get, you are a sadist. You really yeah. get a thrill. Because it's not about identification. Like, she's just never going to know who you were. They asked during the interrogation why he killed um, mm-hmm. Jessica. And Good. he said because her story would have been recognized. I what? guess because of the, because Marie France was killed. I don't, I don't know. It's like he said to me saying, because then y'all know that a serial criminals happening. I'm like, well, they knew that with the tr- Tweed Creeper. They, we've right. known that. Right. Fucker. Whatever. Um, he hid her body in his garage and then drove to the base to sleep because he had an early flight to California the next day. He came back to the Tweed house on February 2nd and dumped her corpse in a wooded area nearby, which is where he led the cops after his confession. So he's answering everything freely to the cops during the interrogation and later in court. But there are a few things he can't answer. One being why he just keeps <sighs> saying he doesn't know. He also will not confess to the child pornography that they found on his computer. Fuck you. What? Who is it? Your wives? Shut up. Yeah. Uh, what does his wife say? Oh, uh, we not, we'll get there. My um, insides are on fire. I'm feeling. He, so that's why I'm saying, like, aside from the disgusting pictures of him masturbating in, like, 12-year-old bedrooms, he had child por- pornography on his computer. It, I mean, 100% was going to, a child, more victims were coming. Oh, my God. 100 so that he won't admit to. That's the only thing he won't admit to. Oh, your credibility shot, you douche. Uh, monster. I mean, really, I'm fuming. I, I just got, oh, God. He got the maximum sentence, two life terms in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years for first-degree murders, both of the first-degree murders. He was also sentenced to 10 years each for the two sexual assaults, as well as one year each for the other charges he faced. He's currently at a prison in Kingston, Ontario. They also stripped him of his rank, obviously. Oh, God, please. They, in a very rare move, they even burned his uniform. Oh, I remember that. Mm-hmm. And they crushed his car and recycled like the metal scrap. Good. What's crazy is that his pension for the military is untouchable. So he's still getting about $60,000 a year for the rest of his life. He always will. They can't touch that. Nothing they can do about that. It's probably for the best because a bunch of lawsuits come. Uh, Mary Elizabeth, his wife, was completely blindsided with betrayal. She maintained she had no idea Russell had this out of him, and police believe she had no involvement. Oh, uh, yeah. She immediately filed for divorce and has never done an interview, has never really talked about it. I'm sure. I don't blame her. There's debate. Some people think she knew. I, I don't. In 2011, Lori Mascott filed a lawsuit against Mary Elizabeth Russell and the OPP for $7 million in damages for pain, suffering, and emotional and mental distress. She said the OPP mishandled the investigation by not warning the community about the Jane Doe attack only 10 days before hers. She had no idea until oh, she, the cops wow. got to her house. Well, they may have thought it was an isolated incident then. Well, but I mean, still. Well, they told her when she described what happened, they're like, this sounds exactly like a case we just took 10 days ago. And she was like, excuse me, that happened here 10 days ago and you, the community doesn't know. All right. No. Yeah. I guess one, even one, you should warn the community. Just warn. If the, you haven't, yeah. If actually, there was a random break in yeah, and this happened. Right. Yeah. Very weird. They also Why left. Why did she sue Mary Elizabeth? With them? Um, Why is she named in the suit? There, there were a couple of, and I'm sorry if this is not right. I don't know a hundred percent. So I'm just going to say it. (laughs) One of the victims put it out there. There, there are a few lawsuits from the victims. One of them said, yeah, right. Mary Elizabeth knew everything. She's also been accused of hiding assets after the fact to alleviate, you know, the, the impact on her. I don't know. 
Mm. I think it was Lori, though, who said bullshit. I oh, think. Wow. I don't know. So people think, I don't think she's involved. Cops don't think she's involved. I don't know how you would. She he just was, did that to like say, like, she probably wasn't working at the time. And was like, well, no, I'm... she was executive. She had an executive position. Oh, she's, that is they weird. Were, they oh, were good. She okay. was good. Okay. Um, but I, I, he lived by himself in right. their vacation home himself. five days a week. I just, I'm like, I just think it's possible that she Golden didn't State Killer was married. BTK was married. All the evidence, all his keepsakes were hidden very, very well. I mean, were, they were hidden in his basement. Somewhat said, like, even in the rafters at some points. Where if your husband's a very high-ranking military guy, I, I would want to know nothing about what's in the boxes. I mean, oh, what if it was true. like classified information and he right. shouldn't have them. I would be like, just let's keep me in the dark about that one. I don't want to know it's shit. Right. So, yeah, she also said in the lawsuit, uh, this is still Lori Mascot's lawsuit, that OPP mishandled it, not warning the community, but they also left her tied up while they gathered evidence. No. And one officer apparently insinuated that she was making the whole thing up, even though, again, the exact same crime almost happened 10 days before. So she was just like, fuck all y'all. Y'all mishandled it. I'm suing everyone involved. In 2016, the lawsuit was settled for an undisclosed amount. We love an undisclosed amount. She was very happy. All we know is that she was very pleased with the outcome. You're making this up. How dare you? Fuck off. What are you doing? <sighs> I hate people. They're the worst. I think Jessica Lloyd's family and Jane Doe also filed lawsuits. Um, Mary Elizabeth Worm was involved in those. I don't know the outcomes of those. There's just a bunch of lawsuits. Those That one, um, Jessica Lloyd's lawsuit had something to do with the hiding assets. Oh, okay. But so we don't know. I, I lean towards um, Mary Elizabeth was betrayed in a horrible way. Mm -hmm. But... That is the batshit story of the creep, Russell Williams. And here's what else is interesting. Of all the evidence and all the reports, none of this seems to have started until 2007 when he was 44 years old. Like, what ha What brought this on? This is, no, it didn't. Yeah, what happened to him as a child? He went to a very um, prestigious boarding school. Let me see where he... Paul Bernardo's held. Kingston! Paul Bernardo and Russell Williams are in prison together. Say the penitentiary. Paul Bernardo is in Kingston Penitentiary. Millhaven? Uh, oh, oh, La Mescaza Institution? Mescaza? Mescaza? <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm saying a whole <laughs> bunch of things. He was in Kingston until 2013, and then they moved him to La, uh, La Mescaza. But you said Russell Williams was in Kingston. So yeah, he's in Kingston. Okay, well, they're, in, they're there together for a little bit. Oh, no. Notable inmates have included convicted murderers, Paul Bernardo, Russell Williams, okay. Michael Rafferty. Wow. That wow. Is, that did not start when he was in his 40s. Come on. It definitely escalated. But he's probably been stealing. I don't know. I know. I, I just, that just seems. So, yeah, yeah. You're right. I don't know. That is wow. bat shit crazy. I didn't expect to cry. I practice without. That's okay. You're a human. Okay. Patrons, welcome, Kit, Meredith, Kira, Heather, Vladimir, MJ, Brenda, Alexandra, Bella, and Emily. Thank y'all. Thank you. Bonus ups coming at you. We're recording the next one in three days. Mm -hmm. The custom shout out is from Kira. She said, most people don't know that travel agents are 100% free. We handle finding accommodations, bookings, tracking deals, and giving all the information you need for a relaxing vacation. For PATW listeners, the first 10 to fully book and mention your podcast will receive a $50, $50 gift card for the trip they booked prior to the date, that, date of travel, usually about a week before. I special mm -hmm. on all things Disney, Universal, most major cruise lines, airlines, and hotels. I can handle domestic and international travel as well. I go more into depth on all the venues and companies I'm certified in on my website. I'm still building up my socials, but check out my Instagram at dreamadventures underscore travel. Or TikTok, Dream Adventures Travel. So no underscore. Mm -hmm. And Dream is with no S. Dream Adventures with an S. Uh-huh. Travel. Okay. Got it. Go there. Go to either one of those for the link to the website and all the other social medias. And even if you can't book a trip now, I appreciate any support I get. I can get while I try to grow more across all social media platforms. Sorry. I really fumbled there. Fumbled. A like or a comment can go a long way. Thank you again. Oh. 
Yes, it can. Yes, it can. That oh, algorithm's well, tricky. It's a tricky business. I uh, like a comment, a review. If if you're on podcast networks, the it goes a long way. If you're on podcast networks, like I'm just saying, an engagement of that sort across all platforms. Oh, uh, right. I'm like subtly telling people thought, to review us. No, I'm like no review her. <laughs> I know it goes a long her. way. We keep, we keep making these custom shout outs about us. Um, it does. It goes a long ways. Yeah. So go follow, like, do everything. It's again on Instagram, Dream Adventures underscore Travel, and on TikTok, it's Dream Adventures Travel with no underscore. You, you know, know, maybe that's what we need. Uh, I already um, reached out when she gave her custom shout out. I emailed her back and I was like, you know, me and my husband have been trying to book an out of country trip for mm, months. But it's like, we're both very busy. And by the time nighttime comes and we want to talk about it, I'm like, uh-uh, let's just go to bed. We'll deal with it later. Oh my God. And there was like a long time where people were, were saying that travel agents were obsolete because now we have the internet we can do it all ourselves i'm like right. yeah but, but we're who becoming lazier to. yeah no, who wants everything's to do a convenience we get mm-hmm. groceries delivered no everything needs to be convenient they're back mm-hmm. if they, if that was they're true back. a couple of years ago fine but it's back because we are only getting lazier i'm not booking shit i'm too busy either i'm not planning researching what island i want to go thing. to no i can't do that just tell me oh god right so yeah exactly right. kira we see girl you. we see you Thanks, Thanks, everyone. everyone. <laughs> you don't know how to transition away from that. You are the best. People are the worst. Russell Rus- fucking Williams is the worst. This the week. absolute worst. Gross. Bye. Bye.